So now we're headed into a bit of a big session, Merci. Uh, where we will have one conversation and then two different round tables. And that topic is on fast moving consumer goods, goods that we all use every day. And so in our first conversation will be from CEO of Pierre Saint Vivo, Olivier Blanchet, speaking with Professor Pierre Chandon. Yes, uh, Pierre Chandon is an old friend yes, of uh, Pierre S. Uh, in vivo. He is the L'Oréal Chair Professor of Marketing Innovation and Creativity at INSEAD. He is also the Director of the INSEAD Sorbonne University Burial Lab. He is an expert in food marketing and in the application of behavioral science uh, to this uh, world. He studies innovative marketing solutions to better align business growth with consumer health and well-being. Welcome, Pierre. And welcome, Olivier. Thank you, Eric. I don't know if that works. That yeah. works. Hello, Pierre. Uh, very happy and uh, honored to uh, start this uh, FMCG conversation with you, uh, Pierre. There is one question we ask to everyone, so you are not going to escape it, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, the first question is, is how, you, how you discovered uh, behavioral science and nudge. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we all remember when, when we first thought that was interesting. So I'm very, very uh, curious to know uh, you, how you fell uh, into it. Um, yeah, I was saying that uh, we, I fell into behavioral science uh, from the very first day of my PhD program because I was interested in sales promotions and everyone thought, okay, it's just a price reduction and actually realized that it was way more than that because it has hedonic advantages. It's fun. It's symbolic benefits. You know, people feel smart or they feel embarrassed by that. And then it influences way beyond just purchase, but the entire consumption. And you know, as someone who's interested in food, I'm half French, half Italian. So of course, food is really important for me. It was really interesting to, to uh, go beyond what economists would typically look at saying, okay, it's just a price cut. We know what it is to actually show it's much richer than that. And then we can use all of the different uh, aspects and angles from psychology, basically, to uh, better change behaviors, hopefully in a way that's uh, aligning health, business, and also consumer goals. But that's really been uh, what I've discovered from the very beginning and what I've been doing ever since. It's been um, pretty much 20 years now. So based on, first on pricing, and you started talking about uh, food. So um, of course the link with uh, uh, FMCG is pretty obvious for me. So um, my next question is about FMCG and uh, in what way uh, behavior science is particularly interesting for FMCG. And because you talked about it uh, for food mainly. Yeah, I think the key word with FMCG is repetition and as a result, habits. And we heard from Wendy Wood, who's a friend and uh, someone I admire a lot, that habits are everywhere. You know, most of the things we do are habitual. Most of the purchases we do with food, but not just with food, are habitual. It's not something that we uh, really think uh, about every time. In fact, that's the definition of a habit, right? It's doing something even without thinking about it. And so um, how to break bad habits, how to change habits, is uh, uh, the key for FNCG. And uh, here's where I think nudging can really help because there are many other frameworks, persuasion, for example, that work well when it's a real decision, when you're looking at the pros and the cons, et cetera. But if it's something that's just repeated because it's directly primed by the context, then these frameworks no, no longer work so well. Uh, just to give one example, we've all been watching more or less what has happened in London with the funeral of the queen. And all of us, when we've been to a different country where the cars are on the wrong, or the other side of the road, like in London for us French, uh, we know that we're supposed to look in the other direction. We have all of these signs that tell us when you're about to cross the street, you know, look right. Um, but even we know uh, or look left, so depending, see, I'm confused now uh, because I don't, I don't, you know, exactly. It's, it's just based on habit. Um, and, um, but if you're French, you're going to look to the left because this is where cars supposedly come. And even though it says look right, and even though you know you're not supposed to, it will be just impossible not to follow your habit. So this is uh, really uh, 
the key issue in for us in FMCG, uh, and they've been shown again and again and again. You give people horrible popcorn in a movie theater because they have a habit of eating popcorn, they will eat it. Do they think it tastes good? No, they know it tastes horrible, but they're just used to doing it. Uh, but if you do it in a different context, then, then uh, they will actually start thinking instead of going with the habitual response. So I really, I think this idea of uh, habits and the importance of repetition and the importance of context, these are all uh, domains for which nudges work particularly well. And not just for food, by the way, but uh, for you know, most uh, consumer uh, decisions or consumers' repeated behaviors for FNCG goods. I, I can't agree more. Uh, of course, on uh, FMCG and, and uh, building habits or reinforcing or breaking uh, habits. Uh, you, you, we talk about nudge. We, you talked about nudges. Uh, so my, my next question is, is maybe to go a bit more in, in detail of uh, nudges and or the experiments you you, you ran. Um, first, ca can we categorize nudges uh, m more precisely than just uh, saying nudge? And the second thing is, can we say they are all equal or not? So um, as a professor, you know, I'm so used to uh, showing slides, etc. I could not resist. And so to answer this question, I prepared a little slide. This is the result of really, uh, it's going to be super fast, don't worry, you know, a really big meta-analysis. We had 299 studies done in the field, in supermarkets, in restaurants, looking at different types of nudges. And uh, the, the answer is very simple, okay? If you look at cognitive nudges, these are nudges that are there to inform people about what's good for them, what's healthy, nutrition, etc. If you look at their effectiveness, at changing uh, food behaviors. For example, do they actually improve the healthiness of consumption? We looked at number of, of uh, cubes of sugar as a met common metric. What we find is just descriptive labeling basically doesn't work. Uh, if you uh, put the healthy food in an um, easier uh, location where it's easy to see, almost no difference. If you actually start giving people um, color codes to tell them not just uh, describing the nutritional quality, but whether or not it is uh, good or bad for them, then the effects starts to uh, be found. But I've actually done this uh, at the request of the French government, this huge study, 1.6 million observations, and the effects, to be honest, like Nutri-Score, et cetera, they're really tiny. So um, the, and let me just fast forward here. Uh, see, I had a lot of stuff, but you know, there it is. Uh, if you really want to change people's habits in FMCG, it's not enough to talk to the brain, you have to talk to the heart. So for example, in the context of healthy eating nudges, if you uh, start uh, describing food using taste, I mean, it's very simple, right? But instead of saying that uh, these uh, green vegetables are full of antioxidants, which by the way, tend to have a negative effect because people think if they're healthy, they're probably not tasty. If you start describing the taste, the sound, the sensory experience, you can actually find a really positive effect. And if you sell healthy food, like junk food, on taste and sensory experience, you can have more than double. So here we have you know, uh, more than double the effectiveness uh, of the other nudges. And finally, the third nudges, I call them behavioral nudges. These are nudges that don't try to inform you. They don't try to motivate you using emotions. They just manipulate you, which is basically that's why we have the hand here. For example, if you make this more convenient, if the fruit, instead of having to peel it, is right in the uh, pre-peeled, in the plate, directly into your mouth, you know, then uh, it will have a much stronger effect. And the strongest effect of all are size enhancements, changing the quantity of food. Because people are very sensitive to what they eat, but they will eat whatever you put in front of them. And so you can see here to answer your questions that no, nudges are not all equal. And as the focus of the nudge shifts from the brain to the heart and to the hand, the effectiveness of the nudge can be multiplied by two and then by three. So I think it's very important for all of us to stop treating nudges um, together. There are big differences in the effectiveness of nudges. And that works at home, by the way. I tried the, the fruit peeling and cutting with my kids, and uh, 
if you leave peach on the table and say, hey, guys, eat fruit, eat fruit, and just don't touch it. If you peel and cut, it goes just uh, naturally. So uh, I agree. I fully agree. Um, the last question is is the same as the beginning. You won't escape this question, uh, Pierre. Is um, what advice would you give to? So if we talk to FMCG uh, practitioners, brand managers, product managers, what uh, yeah advice would you give to uh, a practitioner who who want to start applying uh, behavioral science nudge in the uh, field of FMCG? So I, I listened to uh, the, the conference and. And I heard already, I think, the most important arguments. Number one, test, okay? Um, because you, you, you don't know what's gonna work in your particular domain. Um, it's not because it's been published in one context, in one domain. To give you an example, I've done a lot of work on using pleasure as the ally of healthier eating. And I find that, for example, among the French, if you describe the food, you talk about the flavors, the aromas, the texture, and um, it will lead them to actually choose a lower amount of food because they realize that I don't need to eat too much to really enjoy the pleasure. And in fact, I know that the highest pleasure comes from the first bites. If after a while, you know, it's not that pleasurable. Well, you know, you apply that with Americans and you find the same effect, but much, much smaller. Uh, and so I think uh, you, you, you need to uh, test you need to, um, like we heard from John List and the others. Number two, I think uh, it's important to um, think about the context, okay? Um, everything is very complicated. So uh, you cannot assume uh, that what worked uh, in one way worked in, in the other. And, and, and I think it's uh, another reason why we should, uh, we should be testing. And the final thing is, and that's, I think it's especially important if you're in a controversial industry like food. For good or bad reasons, um, there's not just the um, level of trust from the public is low. I think there's an active distrust of the industry. And this is true in many domains, right? Um, and so I think my recommendation when that happens is to collaborate with researchers. Why? Because if you do something on your own and you say, look, um, it's good for the business, it's also good for consumers, but you're the one doing the test and declaring victory. Even if you're totally honest and it's correct, people won't believe you because they don't trust you. So uh, I think what I've been doing, for example, myself, working with many companies, uh, some of which we heard from, is to say, I will um, work independently. I will publish the results. We publish also the study plan. And then you, what you obtain is a certification from an independent third party because there's no money involved, et cetera, that says, look, this is what happened. And I certify through the scientific process and the publication that uh, you can trust the results. And so I think this would be another recommendation when it's uh, worth it, when it's a very controversial topic, I think it helps to get the third party certification, for example, by collaborating with, with scientists. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And I think there, there is uh, many of these cases uh, coming soon. Um, so uh, last thing, I think uh, I just encourage uh, everyone to to read uh, Pierre's uh, work because it's, uh, it's academic, but it's uh, very down to real life stuff. The last one, Epicurean marketing is, is very, very uh, interesting. So thank you again, Pierre, for... Uh, for uh, giving some time uh, to this uh, Human uh, Advantage conference. Thank you, Olivier. It's a pleasure to be here. So it's time now to uh, start our first roundtable on uh, about the session regarding fast-moving consumer goods. Ted is seated because it's not Ted as a moderator uh -oh. for this roundtable. It is Ted as a speaker because he was strongly involved in an amazing case study about Napisan that you will discover right now. So we are very happy to welcome Alessandra Russo. Alessandra Russo from Italy is insight and analytic manager at Rekit. And we welcome also Francesco Luis, 
with her colleague and brand manager Napisan at Rekit2. Uh, Two colleagues, one is this guy, another guy is Nikos from BVA Doxa, who will moderate this round uh, table. Nikos is the head of business development and strategy at BVA Doxa. So, and Martaro. <laughs> ah, Echo. yeah. Oh, you can't we, see them. I can see them. You can't see them. Yeah, and Marta. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So thanks a lot. Your turn. And Nikos. Nikos's turn. I'll be quiet for once. Okay. Oh, it's <laughs> not possible. Welcome. Welcome and good evening to all people connected to the Human Advantage Conference and to our guests for the round table. So welcome Alessandra, Marta, Francesco, and Ted as a speaker now. Thanks, Eric, for the introduction too. Uh, Napis and Keys uh, that will be discussed in this session brings us back to a very difficult period. Uh, it was uh, spring 2020, uh, 2020 uh, with COVID starting and spreading. And during th that terrible time, uh, we also assisted to the commitment of companies and organizations to contain the pandemic, uh, adopting best practices, but also activating social and responsible initiatives for the community. And on this scenario, what Nepizan plan to do in Italy? Nepizan is a Reiki brand for home and personal hygiene, also known as a Dettol out of Italy. So, uh, Francesco, uh, please, you will be the first. Uh, could you share with us this uh, initiative, uh, the goal and the difficulties, if any? Yeah. Hi, Nikos. Thanks, Nikos. Thanks, Ted, and everyone for the invitation. We are here in, in Milan offices with my colleague, uh, Alessandra. I'm very glad to speak today. So first of all, uh, uh, as Napisan, we have been fighting to keep our loved ones in this free for many years. We will turn 50 years next year. And today, I'm very glad to tell you about the recent evolution of our purpose journey called the Jenny Siem. Everything started two days after the COVID outbreak with a sort of, I guess, epiphany that we all lived or experienced on our skin, that actually hygiene was not only a private matter to be tackled at home, but something really belonging to all of us, affecting all of us. And so as Napisan, we wanted to foster this cultural mindset shift, starting from where the future can change, actually. So schools that were not only at the time uh, the, the most vulnerable frontier or entity, but also a real crucial place where to build a, a responsible future. So if we move to the next slide, we can see how we decided, first of all, to tackle the, the first barrier that was just happening. So lack of products, and this was actually what we've been doing for, for many years, and it is a prerequisite for the success. But of course, these days uh, just after the outbreak uh, were really crazy ones. School were closed, kids learning from home, everything was, was new. So we needed to act quickly, but also with structure. And issues were not only logistic, as you may have known, but also cognitive ones. We're talking about little kids from three up to eight, nine years old. The narrative was very heavy, of course, fearful. Uh, lots of protocols were proliferating. And also we wanted to be scientifically uh, rigorous, but also a little bit light, playful, you know, easy to understand. So the, the challenge was not just the, from a product perspective, from a solution perspective, but was much a uh, behavioral challenge. So therefore, disinfectant products were the basis, but not enough. We needed to find a solution, to find a partner, to develop also content, side content and educational content. This was the main challenge we experienced. Yeah, uh, I understand this. Uh, as a father of two little kids, I remember well those crazy days. Um, and thanks also for having had as a company such uh, caring on uh, our kids. Uh, uh, anyway, as a father, uh, I also know well that uh, just giving good recommendations to kids is not enough, uh, or my life, our lives uh, at all would be really easier. Uh, I assume you were conscious of this, Alessandra, and so what was necessary to do to go beyond the simple uh, records and communication, especially with a hard target such as kids? Yes, so hello also from my side. So yes, really a good question, Nick. Yes, 
with two key behavioral questions. So the first one was really what we were asking ourselves was how to ensure that children wash their hands properly and frequently. So this was the first question we posed ourselves. The second one was how to ensure that children we can keep children engaged in surface disinfection and overall in a proper hygiene routine when they will be back in a, in a, in a school contest. So with this in mind, we reach out to BBA DOXA because first of all, we wanted to understand, identify which were the key triggers and the key barrier to hygiene behavior in school. Uh, and then aware of those, we wanted to create together some nudges to facilitate the adoption of good hygiene gestures behavior by the kids when they will be back in schools. Yeah. Thanks, Alessandra. Well, you know, the problem is not only to understand the barriers, but also to achieve a behavioral change that is quite relevant, especially among young students. So, uh, Ted and Marta, how Nudge can do the magic? Uh, how does it work? Uh, and what is the support uh, of market research in this case? Sure. I think for me, it was important as I was introduced to the Navizan team by Bividoxa um, to understand the context. We've heard a lot of people talking about context. I didn't go to preschool in Italy. I didn't go to elementary school in Italy. So again, I think it's important, and, and we heard from some of the other speakers, we can't just assume that all the heuristics and biases or all the nudges and interventions can work in every context. So I really relied on, on Marta and, and the team at DOXA to understand um, the situation of, of Italian schools more. And Marta, I don't know if you want to talk about how we, how we got there. Yeah, in that we carried out uh online digital ethnographic interview. We involve 16 teachers in our fieldwork, eight from infant school, preschool, and eight from primary school with a good distribution among all the Italian territory. And we listen for them and, but, as you can see, you can know we can't do in-person observation due to, due to the COVID situation because remember our fieldwork was managed on April uh, 2020 during the first COVID pandemic wave, schools were closed. Uh, so the teachers were our highs in the classroom to relate to us what happens in a typical school day. Uh, and in light of the situation, we decided that uh, prior interview to ask to teacher to complete a propedeutical individual exercise, a pretask, with the aim of collecting their daily school routine. Uh, some of the teacher provided us also uh, with photos of their classroom, of the buildings, uh, of the activities that they carried out during previous month of school when school were open. And this exercise was very useful for us uh, because from one side, it had teacher describe more explicitly with us, uh, and from other side, it helped uh, us to understand more literally what they were referring to, and better understand the potentially useful touch point where we can intervene. Uh, with pre-task and material collected, so photos, uh, it was very easy and interesting to manage the online interview with teacher. And with teacher, uh, during one-to-one -one interaction, the objective were to uncover uh, the typical classroom behavior as they pertain to, so school arrival, uh, storing jacket and personal belongings, learning time, uh, playtime, lunch and snack, uh, bathroom breaks, interaction with other children outside the classroom, but inside the school, living for home. At the end, uh, we listened 16 different experiences, and it didn't matter if we only heard something from one teacher. Uh, if they said it, it was important to them, so we didn't need a consensus or a majority, but just interesting point. And we listened for very interesting point, uh, uh, we listened for levers, driver for hygiene, because uh, we were looking for anything and everything that helped kids 
stay hygienic and comply with good hygiene, but also barrier for hygiene because, because we were looking also for everything and everything that prevent kids from being hygienic. So existing habits, a lack of tools uh, uh, to be clean. At the end, we produced uh, an inspiration deck, uh, a document uh, shared and applied uh, at the subsequent Nudge co-creation sessions, uh, step two of our process. Well, Ted, from the inspiration deck to the production of Nudges, uh, so how was the, the process uh, and the collaboration with the research and with the racket? And maybe please, uh, just to understand better, if you can share some uh, Nudges example. Sure. So I think, as Marta said, um, pre-COVID or in an ideal scenario, we would have probably conducted face-to-face -face research. If we could have gotten permission, we would have probably observed students in the school day. And of course, on our side, we also would have hosted what we call a nudge lab, this co-creation exercise, face-to-face -face with Alessandra and Francesco and their team. But because of COVID, we were operating between April and June of, of 2020. It was the depths of, of lockdown. And so we had to really think creatively about how do we also apply behavioral science to our own process, which we do, but changing the context from face-to-face -face research and face-to-face -face, um, workshops and co-creation to doing that all virtually made us really um, have to think. So the insights that, that Marta was discussing that come in what we call an inspiration deck categorized or kind of cataloged all those levers and barriers towards hygienic behaviors across the school day, like she said, from when parents drop them off to when parents pick them up. That's bathroom breaks, that's snacks, that's sitting in your own desk. And by really being that precise and that minute, it gave us the opportunity to understand where can we actually affect behavior. We have to keep in mind, hygiene is not a priority when you're four years old. Playing is a priority, making friends is a priority, eating your snack is a priority. So we can't be, and, and we've talked about this in, in the last session too with Pierre Chandon, kind of educative or informative nudges sometimes just don't apply to certain audiences. So we had to really think, and, and thankfully, <laughs> Alessandro and Francesco and their team were open to that, that we were really intervening behaviors instead of telling them COVID is bad, hygiene is good, take yourself seriously, wash your hands. That would never work in this situation. So we collaborated with our BV and Nudge team, with the BV Doxa research team, as well as the Reckitt team to really think about how can we create interventions. You can see on the screen there, we have a, a framework that we use, um, the drivers of influence, which is some heuristics and biases that we know can change behavior, things like a transmitter effect, things like affecting habits, um, loss aversion we've talked about today, creating social norms. How do you create social norms in a first grade classroom around washing your hands? So we really had to challenge ourselves and we did it all virtually. In terms of creating the interventions, like I said, we work through the drivers of influence to really try to tease out where are their academically validated heuristics and biases. That doesn't mean they're all going to work on children in this context with this behavior. So we really tease out a lot of ideas and together we created over 220 interventions. And as I warned Alessandro and Francesco before we even started, some of these interventions are going to be terrible and useless to you. Some of them are going to be absolutely brilliant and super effective. But in the exercise of creating them, we need to kind of create quantity in that first, in that first session because it's about teasing out all the ideas that we can. Um, and again, really categorizing them across the whole school day. It's not just about washing your hands. It's also about sanitizing your desk. It's about you can't give your friends a hug right now. There's a shelf of books in your classroom. And if you use one, you need to wipe it down before the next child uses it. That's where we were with COVID at the time. Now we've learned a lot more about COVID and, and we've worked with, with Alessandro and Francesco's team subsequently, but that's kind of where we were at the time. So quantity over quality in the first step. And then comes a bit of, of siphoning. So what we do is we work the ideas through some evaluation criteria because we knew you know, Francesco only has a certain amount of budget, right? The school can only do certain things from a compliance perspective. Napisen has a portfolio of products, some of which are better in the hands of a teacher than in the hands of students. Something that might work in the, in the canteen while they're having their lunch might not work in the bathroom. So we work through the ideas 
into what we call our kind of evaluation criteria, really looking at feasibility and opportunity and finding out where we can identify the nudges or the interventions that will have the biggest effect, that are the easiest to implement at the lowest cost. And also keeping in mind, there's an intermediary here. We have to have a teacher who's going to also help implement these for us. You know, it would, it would be wonderful if Marta and I could march into the school and get the kids to do it. It would be wonderful if Alessandra and Francesco could march in, but we had an intermediary, which is a teacher. So how also do we make the ideas easy to understand and easy to implement for teachers? So here's a couple of ideas. Nikos has asked for a couple of examples. So one of the ideas we had was stamping uh, the hand of students, almost as the teacher took attendance in the morning when, when the child is dropped off, and you can play the video anytime. Um, you stamp the hand of the student, and that shows them that they're present and accounted for today. So Eric arrives, little Eric, his mother drops him off, and we stamp Eric's hand. And that ink from the stamp will only disappear after four or five washes throughout the day. So it also becomes a very measurable way for the teacher throughout the day to say, Eric, it's 2 p.m. and that stamp is as clear as it was in the morning. You haven't been washing your hands enough. And again, it becomes a measurable task for the parent at the end of the day to say, ah, Eric, okay, you must have washed your hands. It's gone today. Or, Eric, why do I still see the stamp? Did you wash your hands after your snack? Did you wash your hands after you went to the bathroom? Did you wash your hands after you went to the library? So finding a way to make that kind of measurable. Another idea that we had that, that really we kind of leverage what was happening on, on social media um, is we, we know from having some of the psycho uh, child psychologists who, who Nafizan works with that physical touch is really important for young children. It's how they learn. It's how they learn to build relationships with teachers, with other adults, with other children. And we wanted them to have a way to be able to greet their teacher in the morning in a contactless way. So we gave a suggestion of different ways they could use kind of things like sign language of saying a hug or sign language for a high five. They could do a TikTok dance. And that allowed the teacher to have a personalized individual greeting with each student that makes them feel special, that makes them feel connected, but still allows them to have the safe social distancing that, that was required when schools reopened. Great. Over to you, Nicholas. Yeah. Very, very funny, the little girl dance. And I understand that making it funny Playable is one of the elements to drive behavior adoption that is potentially more effective than simple rational communication. Absolutely. So, Alexandra, uh, talking about implementation, uh, we are all very curious uh, about the effects, the results. So, did it work? Have you had uh, any evidence? Yes, yes. So uh, the implementation of, uh, of the nudges was definitely a key element of the success of the uh, Vigen and CMA educational program. So we observed a very strong impact amongst the children that joined the program with 70% uh, of the teachers observing spontaneous improvement in kids' hygienic behavior. And I would like to underline the word spontaneity, spontaneous, because when a gesture becomes spontaneous, this means that the gesture has been interiorized by the, by the kid, by the child, and therefore we should expect that from that moment on, the, the gesture will be actioned in a, in a natural way. And in fact, uh, it's not by chance that then 77% of parents observe this good hygiene behavior being carried by the kids also at home. So uh, I, I believe we can definitely say that the program Hygiene um, Insieme has been a real helper for everybody that was involved in daily school life, even from, and then even from a scientific perspective, uh, we have collaborated with the uh, Universita Vita Salute San Raffaele, which is a premier uh, public health university here in, in Italy. And they run a test to look at COVID rate in schools in the province of Lombardy, which is located in the Northern of Italy. And this study proved a minus 14% of COVID incidents versus the region average. And the, the finding of this, uh, of this study were even published then in an academic uh, journal called Acta Biomedica as a part of, uh, of a series of, uh, of COVID effect. 
Well, Francesco, on the marketing side, uh, how the program has been rolled out? Yeah, so the program, which was born in 2020, has literally grown a lot uh, over the last uh, three years, thanks to a pretty uh, strong and wide uh, range and network of partners. We have been able to deliver the nudges and the content kit to over 10,000 public schools uh, throughout Italy, from north to south, meaning more than 1.4 million uh, total kids involved in the program. So the scope was very big, but of course, as uh, we, we wanted to democratize access to a gene and all of this, uh, we also kind of taught teachers uh, with the, in partnership with the Ministry of Education how to uh, leverage the nudges we convey to them digitally and also interpret them so to give access to more uh, kids as possible. And another tool we used to raise school engagement uh, was a contest when we asked those teachers and students to execute at best and display and showcase to us these nudges and to send their output that could be a drawing, or we're talking about little kids, a video or interview, maybe also engaging parents at home, no? from school to, to, to families, and we'll talk about it later. And we received tons of user-generated content that were not only very insightful from a market research perspective, but were also leveraged as marketing assets no? to convince other consumer, other parents, other schools to join the program. So it was very a uh, virtual cycle that we were able to, to build, definitely. I think, sorry, I'm going to interrupt Nikos. I think what's super exciting about the way we went at this and the way that, that the Reckitt team was willing to go there was they weren't looking for a single intervention or a single nudge to be that kind of silver bullet to fix it. We knew that couldn't work. And so the toolkit that they produced, it wasn't just products. It was products accompanied with a set of nudges that were kind of preloaded, ready to go, ready to implement, but also some nudges that teachers could opt in on. So some kind of optional additional nudges that took a little bit of work on their side and to kind of teach the teachers. So between the public health university and I did a session and, and, and Reckitt did a session of kind of teach the teachers and educate them about why behavioral science, why have we done it this way? And I think that's a really important thing to think about when we apply behavioral science is that it isn't magic. It's not some alchemy. It's thinking about the science behind the behavior and trying a number of interventions and a number of ways in. And I really think we wouldn't have gotten to these great results if we, if we hadn't kind of thrown a lot of different things at the problem. And so I think, you know, their ability to, to fund this <laughs> was a big deal, but also their willingness to say, let's try lots of things instead of waiting for one campaign or one perfect product partnership or one perfect solution, I think was a big, was a big deal. Sorry, back to you, Nikos. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Uh, so now a question for both Francesco and Alessandra, because we talked about the 2020 project, uh, but after these, which have been the developments, um, other plans involving behavioral science application uh, in Reckitt? Yes, of course. Uh, maybe I'll pick the first side of the answer and then I'll let Alessandra talk about the future. Of course, one year after the first implementation, so we're talking about summer 2021, we re engage again with the TED and, and the team after this uh, fruitful collaboration to roll out more of the nudges that we've developed. As said, uh, uh, more than 27 were produced, so we have a sort of load then to deploy, but also to stress test and to really uh, tackle some cognitive and learning barriers in order to be very salient, very, 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 very precise also for the uh, post-pandemic environment. No? It is an, an ever-going program. And so we used some uh, lenses some, uh, from diversity and inclusion, and we decided to partner with an association expert in AAC. So augmentative and alternative communication is a, a set of symbols that we use to adapt our nudges. And this set of symbols really uh, granted access to the knowledge, not only for students with maybe some cognitive impairments, but also to lots of students, we're talking about public schools, with low proficiency in Italian. And so we deploy this content, not just to them, but to the teacher and to the other, uh, to the other students. So in order to, 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 to give these tools, these interpretation tools to everyone. And it is as for now, but then we're working hard to, to secure the future. And I let Alessandra speak. In. Yes, yes. Talking about future. So I, I can just reiterate that at NAPITAN, we are very committed in keep breaking the chain of infection where it matters, when it matters. And so we want to extend our program from schools to homes. 
And uh, the, the mission we give given ourselves is really to try to normalize hygiene with a simple and effective uh, routine. So we are also aware that to achieve this mission, we need uh, to drive both a mindset and also a behavioral change. So uh, related to the second part, so the behavioral change, we are keep uh, collaborating with the BBA DOXA, uh, leveraging the behavioral science to enable more kids to spark small uh, behavior gesture uh, to, to then, you know, bring changes within the established family routine. So this is what yeah. the future is ahead of us. Okay. Good. So we are close to the end. And so thanks uh, for sharing the NEPISEN case and really congratulations for the results achieved. Uh, Ted, I think next step, uh, you will have to teach me some uh, nudge hints to make my children eat vegetables. I know that Olivier, in the previous session, talked about this, but my, you know, my children are very resistant also to, to nudge. <laughs> so now, before moving to the Q&A session, uh, I have uh, just a, a final question from my side to you, Ted, a serious one this time. Because, uh, you know, uh, NAPI's mission uh, was uh, bonded to the period uh, and uh, had a purpose uh, uh, that was relevant also for the community. But in normal times, we usually receive requests to support FMCG companies uh, at uh, pushing the choice uh, and sales of products. Uh, so new products, new formats, uh, new packaging. And so can NAJ and behavioral science apply to research uh, help as well uh, to address these uh, desired behaviors, so uh, maybe purchase behaviors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've heard about it a little bit in the session with Wendy Wood earlier. Pierre just mentioned it in the last session. A lot of the shopping that we do is really habitual as well. We, ha we are in habits of, you know, I could almost navigate the small supermarket across the street from my house with a blindfold on. I shop the same things. There's some aisles. I, I don't have any kids. I don't have any pets. There's certain sections of the, of the store that I never shop, and there's certain sections of the store that I always shop. So we look at behaviors, you know, we love to work on something like reducing COVID in schools because it, it's, it's wonderful, but we work on all sorts of challenges and behavior is behavior. And so it's really important that we kind of diagnose or define current behaviors and understand what people are doing now and then define what we want the desired behavior to be. So in this case, it was, Students are rarely washing their hands because they're not forced to, and there's no real risk. They're not sanitizing their desks because it's pretty much left up to the janitorial staff of a school. COVID gave us the reason to change the behavior. But with a lot of our other clients, if it's you know, buying products or services, it might be, you know, we work with utility companies, getting people to use uh, you know, better energy. We've done some of that work uh, in, in Italy with Bividoxa. Um, we wanna guide people towards choices. We're never forcing them to. There was never any point in this study where we, you know, slammed a bottle of Napizan on a student's desk and forced them to do anything. In any behavior change objective, we're leaving the options open to, to people to make a choice, but we're guiding them or we're creating changes in the context that makes a better choice easier, simpler, faster, nicer, make them feel better. And that, to, to, I'm kind of coming around to your question, Nikos, but... We can certainly do that in terms of product purchase. You know, we're, we're in discussions with a lot of clients now. Um, there's legislation in the UK at the moment around high fat, sugar and salt content food. Some products that are on the shelves in supermarkets either are not going to be available or they're going to be very deprioritized. How do we help those clients guide shoppers to still buy products in their portfolio that are healthier, that are more compliant? We talk to a lot of manufacturers about um, you know, greener formulations, including Reckitt. We talked to some of their teams where they have made a product now that has a more ecological package or it has a more ecological recipe or format. And how do we get people to kind of break their current habit of buying the kind of product they've bought forever that their mom bought before them and buying a product that might be better for them or better for the world? So behaviors are behaviors, I guess is my, is my short answer, but we have to really understand those current behaviors, understand what's a, what's a habit, and, and, you know, break some current habits and build some better habits that are good for the consumer or the citizen, if it's the case of public policy. Um, but of course, you know, this has to be good for business too. And, and Alessandro and Francisco have, you know, have had access to 
an amazing ability to touch lots of different things in school and have access to lots of product. But at the end of the day, this has to have, uh, you know, a good impact on, on either brand impressions or the business. And we understand that, you know, behavioral science can be a tool for good and still can be good for business. It doesn't have to always be just kind of, you know, public policy benevolence. It can be great for business as well. Uh, good. We received a, a, a question for Fran Francesco. Um, what has been the impact, uh, if any, of this project uh, on the brand? Yeah, thank, thanks, Nibos, for the question. Since we, we have been measuring and tracking all the inputs uh, of uh, all the outputs uh, of this uh, of this program, as we have seen, behaviorally speaking, uh, societally speaking, but of course also from a brand equity perspective. So the answer is uh, we did we have seen an impact on brand health and equity, and also for, from a from a recent map about value uh, and advantages, not only about human advantages and brand advantages today, we have seen that. Some purpose claims, attribution, such as, for instance, I do trust Napisan. Napisan is a brand I can rely on. Or also, Napisan helps me keeping my family safe. Are actually statistically linked to performance, to the performance KPI, which means a brand that does what it promises. They are strongly linked more than functional attributes, which are vital, crucial, you know, product versatility, germ kill efficacy, uh, germ kill efficacy and safety. And we've seen that these uh, purpose KPIs are actually nurturing. There's a very strong correlation with the performance. So the answer is yes, we are keeping it monitoring. And also we are making it as a, as a powerful marketing tool, not only, of course, to expand our product, program, but also to convey uh, our purpose from a, a marketing perspective to end users. So yes, the answer is uh, it, we are really benefiting from a brand perspective uh, from this program. Definitely. Clear. Uh, Alessandra, an, a question for you now. Has the Napisan project experience changed uh, in some way your work uh, and your business in Rakit? Right. So, uh, well, at Racket, I, I would say that we have redefined our business to align our brand with, with the brand purpose. So what, what we have learned is that we can't just have a purpose without a clear behavior to impact. So that's it. Because, because why? Because if we just decide, I would say, on a purpose, that will likely only result in, you know, some sort of very good campaign, a very good calm. But, and this eventually may also impact some attitudes, but, but then won't necessarily then result in a, in a real, in a real mm -hmm. change. Yeah. So I would say that at Racket, we, we really try, we, we really define a behavior that we want to change. And then we work also to guide that behavior, yeah. So uh, and doing all of this that we have done for 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 Napisan, I would say has really revolutionized a bit the, the how we do work as a team, and uh, and then it also has to be uh, to, to be also very successful because as we said that has, has proved to to bring a real impact yeah. on, on society. So yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. We have uh, about uh, five or six minutes left. Uh, this is about for research. So to you, Marta, about ethnographics. Uh, would have uh, been uh, different uh, if not limited by COVID. Uh, and uh, are these ethnographic different anyway from uh, other normal ones not integrated with Nudge? Uh, yes, uh, mm, let me say in qualitative research, in, in ethnographic approach, uh, uh, we always prefer to observe actual behavior more than just use claim behavior. But we felt that the teacher uh, in this project did uh, a very good job considering all the limitation and the, dif the difficult circumstances. But ideally, we would have loved to observe and see the student interacted with one another, with the teacher, uh, within the school building. Ethnographic is a very insightful approach to unearth drivers, barriers, and opportunity for a change. And um, as you know, in DOXA, we have improved the way we carry over ethnographics thanks to the behavioral science learning and the application. But that being said, it really helped to be methodical in our approach with the teacher interviews. 
uh, having them walk through the school day and explaining what might seem uh, like small things to them were actually very interesting for us. I think that this is how probably in this project we could identify small moments to intervene. So uh, we have normally different approach, but uh, we use the digital ethnographic due to the COVID situation. And uh, I think that we did a very good job with the, our teacher. Good, okay. Uh, so I know that there is a question from Paris. There is, yeah. Yes. So uh, BVA is present in different countries and you have applied uh, nudges in uh, different cultures. So my question is, uh, have you applied the same nudge in uh, different uh, contexts, uh, in uh, different cultures and have you seen different results uh, depending on the country and the culture? We have. So we've done some work in the, in the pharmaceutical and, and healthcare space and with markets as different as Italy. I'm remembering one project that was Italy, Sweden, UK, Korea. I mean, just the healthcare landscape is so different in terms of what things are prescribed versus what things are over the counter, who you interface with, even with, a, if, even with a, something as, as extreme as an oncology medication, right? Like a cancer drug. In some countries, you would have that discussion with a nurse. In some cases, you would have that discussion with a doctor. In some cases, they can give you something to take home and read. We can nudge that. In other places, that's not allowed. In some markets, there can be branding on that. In some markets, there cannot be. So yeah, we definitely have done, have done that. And in fact, some of the work that we do with Reckitt, I'm working on a project right now with some colleagues of, of Alessandro and Francesco, where we're looking at behaviors around laundry in Brazil and the UK. And we just have totally different relationships with fashion, different relationships with the context of the home. You know, do you have a closet or a wardrobe? Are you storing your clothes in, in drawers? Do you have a washer and a dryer or just a washer? Um, what things are dry cleaned? What things do you wash at home? So absolutely, we work on a lot of multi-market projects. They're not always at the same time. So the example of the healthcare uh, project that, that Eric and I worked on with Beltran, who you saw earlier today, some of those projects were, were staged out over time, but some of them were working on concurrently. And, and you know, context is everything. Just like as Alessandra and, and Francesco said, our next stage, Marta and I are diving in next week, I think Marta, um, to looking at some of these hygienic behaviors for children at home. You know, the school is a very particular environment. It doesn't change that much. You know what I mean? Like a classroom is kind of a classroom. And we saw teachers can organize their classrooms in slightly different ways. But there's usually desks. There's usually a teacher's desk. There's usually some area for reading and playing, etc. When we're going to go into homes now with Napisan, do you, do you share a bedroom as a child? Do you have your own bedroom? Does the family eat at the dining table or does the family eat in front of the television? Is the child allowed to help with food pre preparation? What happens when you enter something that Alessandro and Francesco and I are obsessed with is this idea of entering the home is this kind of division or kind of barrier, I think, is there a kind of frontier, as, as, Frances, as um, Alessandra calls it, between kind of the outside world, which is out of my control and could be unhygienic, and the inside world, which is under my control and I can make it hygienic. But what does that look like? I'm American, but I lived in Asia for 13 years. I take my shoes off the minute I walk in the door. If I don't, I feel dirty. I feel like I'm making my house dirty. I feel like I'm making your house dirty. I moved to London and that's not necessarily everybody's behavior. And so when I invite people over for dinner, I'm in my socks and the dinner party comes in with shoes on. And I have to admit, there's a small part of me that goes, ooh. So there's cultural context, there's kind of spatial context, there's context of what touch points or what materials we can, we can um, nudge or intervene on. Nikos, any questions from the yes. chat or? Uh, we are short in time, so okay. uh, I think that as we are receiving a lot of questions, maybe we will reply to them in the following days. Uh, so uh, let's close the session. Thank you to all, to our guests, to uh, participants. Yeah. And so stay tuned now. Do not miss the next session, Nudging for Good. And so again, thank you to everyone. Goodbye. Bye, thank you very much. Ciao. Bye, ciao. 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 Thank you.
Oh, you're in charts. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Tether, the speaker, was good. As a moderator, he is excellent. As a speaker, not so bad. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, we are starting now our second round table uh, on FMCG again and again. Uh, I can tell you that it is a wonderful uh, one. It is about nudging for good. Uh, really what is the most exciting for us when we have an objective. So I would like to call to Michel Gibbons, who is uh, Managing Director at AIM, European Brand Association. I think we have Jackie Stephenson, Global Responsible Marketing at Mars, somewhere in Europe. We have also uh, Nikta, uh, who is in France, but not uh, with us, who is the Nutrition Director at Savencia. And we uh, also have my friend Gabor Kovacs, somewhere in uh, Europe, who is the Marketing and Communication Director for the Consumer Tissue Brands at ACT. So, wonderful panel, right. moderated this, by yeah. a wonderful guy. So, this is our colleague Etienne Barsou, uh, who's the Chief Behavioral Science Officer at the BVA family, and also uh, the CEO at BVA Nudge Consulting here in France. As you can know the drill by now, 30 minutes of, of kind of structured questions from Etienne to our panel, followed by 10 minutes of question and answer. So put your questions into the chat and Etienne, take it away. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with a very nice panel for speaking about nudging for good, uh, definitely. So I will have my first question uh, for you. Uh, so uh, Michel, you are uh, uh, um, uh, Director General of AIM, uh, which is an association with more than 2,500 uh, FMCG and brand company, which is quite great. So can you tell us more about what is Nudging for Good and uh, what's in it for AIM Brands Association? Thank you, Etienne. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. And with my uh, esteemed panelists of members, um, I feel that um, I'm the lucky one because I've had several of my members already speaking today. You've heard about the fabulous record case. You've heard the insights from Kellogg, from Unilever, from L'Oreal. So there's a big group out there of experts within our industry, um, as you can see, uh, AIM is the Association des Industries de Marque, the European Brands Association. And as you say, we represent two and a half thousand uh, brand manufacturers of branded consumer goods. Um, so in terms of um, nudging and nudging for good, I mean, I think already today, and you will hear shortly from uh, my, my colleagues, um, there's, a, there's a reservoir in our industry of um, knowledge, expertise on consumer insights. I mean, brands are built for, by consumers. Um, we are consumer centric. Uh, we, we wouldn't exist without our consumers. And that relationship with consumers is something that, um, you know, is, is part of our whole approach in looking at nudging for good. So, in nudges, we've heard throughout the day, the discussions around behaviors, how the challenges of changing habits, uh, changing habits that are built over many, many years, what kind of frictions you put in place in order to change those habits, etc. understanding the context of the environment. Part of what we do is look at the broader uh, areas, particularly around policy of health and well-being and sustainability. And a few years ago, going back to 2014, 2015, we were looking at this through the lens of what we need to do from a policy pr perspective, but what other levers are out there. And within our own industry, we have the levers of understanding the consumer. Consumer information works, regulation works, but there's something else that works as well. And that is actually behavioral science and how you can nudge consumers towards taking a more 
health, a healthier, more healthy, more sustainable decision in their purchase. So this started, that journey started in 2014, 2015. Yeah, and that's a, a great initiative and we will have the opportunity to speak a little bit more of how it, how you make it alive in, uh, in him. Uh, maybe uh, Jackie, Jackie, who is a responsible marketing officer at Mars, uh, uh, ca can you tell us why did Mars join that initiative and what you did exactly? Yes, good afternoon. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to take part in the panel today and share the Mars perspective about how we use our brands to nudge for good. Um, and as you've heard from many experts already today and brand owners, nudging techniques have a hugely beneficial effect on consumers and in terms of how they make decisions and make the right choices for themselves and the planet. So at Mars, we know that and we, we take marketing very seriously. We understand the powerful force that it can play um, if used responsibly and can deliver measurable and meaningful benefits to consumers. And so that was one of the reasons we were very, very keen as an A member to join the Nudging for Good initiative and, and participate in our in full capacity that we could to take the insights and the expertise that we could gain from being part of the initiative and really drive that behavior back into the business. Because actually the importance of um, driving societal benefits, um, ensuring consumers live healthier lives and more sustainable lives is at the core of the Mars purpose. The world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. And so making sense of the positive difference we can, can drive through our marketing um, is, is a way of us fulfilling our social purpose as, as Mars. So, yeah, we were very keen to really think about how we could learn from those who, who knew more on this area, how we could learn by doing ourselves and, and, and benefit from the initiative that AIM um, started uh, those many years ago now. Yeah, thank you very much, Jackie. May maybe we can uh, continue with Nikta. Nikta, you are uh, uh, leading the, the group strategy from Savancia on supporting the consumer towards uh, healthier and more sustainable consumption behaviors. C can you tell us a, a little bit more on why you joined the, 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 the nudging for goods uh, uh, topic as well? Tiana, hello everyone. I'm um, delighted to uh, be here with you today and share the Seven Seas experience uh, on Nudge. Um, so as an uh, AIM member, Seven Sia, uh, we're uh, very interested by the initiative uh, on the Nudging for Good uh, campaign. And um, um, in 2016, when we uh, uh, joined the, the working group on Nudging for Good campaign, uh, this first uh, participation uh, has allowed us to introduce uh, at Savencia the nudge methodology uh, with specific focus on behavior change. We, we think that uh, Savencia and all food uh, companies, uh, particularly when they are leader uh, on food uh, markets, we have the responsibility to um, support the consumer uh, toward healthier uh, purchasing behaviors and uh, consumption behaviors. And as uh, uh, supporting the consumer toward healthier, more sus sustainable uh, consumption behaviors is one of the um, uh, main commitments within our uh, CSR plan, Oxygen. Uh, the nudge methodology helps us uh, to orient our actions um, toward, um, um, in a very targeted manner. Uh, toward uh, behavior change. Uh, so, uh, and all this uh, will, um, was uh, in line with official recommendations on what is healthy diet, what is sustainable diet, and so on. So in 2016, uh, when we built uh, the nudge around portion size, uh, you know that portion size is a very uh, efficient lever to uh, rebalance the, uh, the diet. Mm, uh, we uh, proposed with uh, our brand Caprice de Dieu and the product Enquête de Caprice uh, nudge uh, on portion with uh, visual marks on the product or on the packaging, which help the consumer to uh, better understand what is a, a recommended portion of cheese, for example. And we demonstrate that uh, the um, mindful eating is uh, 
reached as uh, people uh, who uh, consumed our products uh, have a better um, control to the quantity um, that they consumed. So this uh, uh, not uh, allowed uh, the consumer to um, take pleasure of eating uh, without uh, constraint and uh, without uh, um, forgetting the pleasure of eating, but um, control uh, and go for a mindful eating. And since then, uh, the brand Caprice des Dieux has uh, roll, rolled on, on all the uh, products in the range uh, this um, approach of uh, nudge uh, portion. And uh, we are also at Savencia uh, trying to implement this kind of nudge uh, on all other brands and categories uh, all over the world. So very interesting uh, to, re to join this collaborative platform at AIM for Nudging for Good. Yeah, I think we'll speak about the other initiative a little bit uh, la later. Uh, what I really love from this initiative, Nudging for Good, is Nikta, you mentioned the CSO plan from the brand and from the company. I love that brand can do something by themselves uh, uh, using recyclable materials and whatever, but I really love the fact that the Nudging for Good initiative focus on not brand doing the things, but brand helping consumer doing something that is sustainable and I think this is very new. So how did you how did you made Michel this initiative came to live uh, thanks to AIM and uh, all the network and all the member you have? And all the great partnership we've had with BVA as well, uh, I should say. So because, I mean, obviously that expertise, you know, what we're doing really here is marrying um, that academic expertise of behavioral science that has been um, in place for so long and bringing that into uh, the consumer goods industry and marrying it with that kind of insights and behavioral insights and reservoir that we had. So we started off in 2015 with the uh, toolkit online um, and the Nudging for Good website is nudgingforgood.com so everybody can go and take a look there. Um, we, we introduced the concept of an awards. Um, and so we ran an awards amongst our membership in 2017. The first one was in 2017, uh, the second one being in 2019. Um, and that, you know, was, was to help stimulate a discussion as well, a learning, um, a sharing, an exchange of best practices amongst the members in the industry, get the word out, um, get an understanding going of there's actually more that can be done with the insights and the expertise that we have, um, understanding the context. I think it was Stephen from Kellogg's earlier who said you need to understand the context of your environment. And that's something that brand, brand owners, brand teams know very, they know their brand best. And so that is something that we could apply. And we decided that we would do an awards because this is, these are issues around sustainability, around um, you know, enabling change, enabling behavioral change. You know, it, it won't just happen just with one brand doing it. It'll be, a, it'll be a mix and it'll be a combined effort to make such changes um, for consumers, with consumers, uh, across the, the sustainability and health and wellbeing portfolios. And that's what we started off with in 2017. And 2019, the 2019 awards then, we introduced a third category around social um, and this whole social area and kind of issues around potentially, you know, social issues potentially like gender. So that was came into play then in 2019 for the awards, for the 2019 awards. So that was highly, a highly popular kind of approach, shall we say, within the membership. Yeah, and I think that we can add that Catherine Steen that we had this morning yes. for the introduction session. Uh, he was remind the, that he was the president of the indeed. Nudging for the World Initiative, which is definitely a, Cass, a great of moment. Of course, Cass mm -hmm. is such an inspiration. He chaired the jury in 2019 for, with the, uh, for the awards of 2019. Okay. Ably, with Eric included in the jury as well. Well, I, I think it's time to welcome Gabor within the conversation. Gabor, you are working on K initiative with the objective of making superior hygiene and care accessible through leading hygiene solution and applying behavioral science and nudge principle to unlock more care for families, society and the planet. So you participated to the Nudging for Good Awards. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about what you've done and your initiative. 
Absolutely. So first, I would also like to greet the audience and also thank you for the opportunity to be here and represent SET, uh, as well as the brands Tseva and Lotus. Um, I really like what you said, Michelle, because in the end, it is really a collective of brands that can really drive an impact. And at SET, we think the same way. Uh, SET is a leading hygiene and health company uh, that is committed to breaking barriers to well-being and also contributing to a healthy, sustainable and circular society. And this mission of the company is brought to life through a number of purposeful brands in its uh, portfolio. And the nudging for good uh, is fitting very well the, the company's DNA as such, and it has been instrumental in driving impact on the purpose that these brands are representing. Um, and of course, not to forget along the way, building a strong brand uh, that people trust, that have a strong emotional connection to, and are also willing to buy, creating shareholder value along the way. Uh, the case that I have brought today is actually for Tseba, uh, our consumer tissue brand in Hungary, with products spreading from, to from toilet paper to paper towels to hankies and facials, all of them product categories that one might think are commodities. But if you think about it, these are all products that people are using multiple times a day, every day, which also gives us an opportunity to truly drive um, a change in people's lives for the positive. Um, it was exactly um, for this reason that we have embarked on this journey. And what is important to say that as a brand, we are all about care. And uh, we firmly believe that care will move the world forward. And if recent times have taught us anything, we need more of it now than ever before, especially for loved ones, society and planet. And that's exactly what we have intended to do in Hungary. We try to understand how can we create more care? What is standing in a way of having more care in families? And we have conducted a big piece of research um, around 30 consumer immersions, really having a deep understanding of the tensions that are uh, happening in families. And then also following up with an online survey asking 200 respondents, 100 males and 100 females, moms and dads, to understand what is what is really holding back having more care in these families. What we have learned was truly insightful. Um, basically, what we learned is family hygiene and care, even today, is still being a female responsibility by default. And in today, when both parents are working, this can really disrupt family life. Not only that, we also learned that if we do not challenge these harmful gender stereotypes that kids see and learn through the hygiene behaviors of adults, it can also shape their outlook on life and limit them in reaching their full potential. So therefore our key objective and key problem to tackle was actually breaking the cycle of passing these stereotypes down from one generation to the next. And only by breaking this chain can we unlock families where both boys and girls are caring for hygiene and as a result unlock more care in these families. So having identified the problem, we also had to identify how are we going to change this? How are we going to resolve it? And what we also learned through these interviews was that a lot of people were not aware that this problem exists and the implications that it has. And the ones that were aware, they were really struggling to talk about and address it because it's a very uncomfortable topic. People were not talking about it in society, and it was even more difficult to bring it up in the family context. Um, and for this reason, actually, these were the first nudges that we created. Um, but at this stage, you're probably asking yourself, what exactly have we done? How did these nudges materialize? For that, I would propose, let's watch this short video next. Okay, so what I suggest is, in the meanwhile, you may have a look to search for the video, and then with Nikta, maybe you can share with us what you've done in complement to what you already presented to us with Caprice de Dieu to participate to the award, the, 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 the award. and uh, Gabor, we are looking for the video to be played just after that, if you don't mind. Okay, okay thank you. Thank yep. you. Um, I can talk about uh, the portion size, the nudge, uh, which was among the winners um, of uh, 2017 campaign, nudging for good campaign. Uh, so um, 
or I can uh, maybe uh, talk about uh, on um, how we uh, define uh, thematics on which we have to work and we have to change uh, uh, behaviors uh, regarding uh, WHO guidelines, Etienne, or do you want do you want me to uh, explain yeah, in details, nudging uh, no, the we, nudge we, portion? We shared, we shared about the FAO guidelines and how you made the nudge for good strategy part of those guidelines. So, um, because uh, the identification of uh, the behavior to change is really a key step when we are building the nudge, uh, we uh, based uh, our um, reflection on uh, uh, we really official uh, documents and reports um, by um, food and agriculture organization or uh, the World Health Organization that have published a report on uh, guiding principles um, for uh, sustainable healthy diets. So this is at a world level and uh, give us uh, really um, very general orientation to follow uh, to go forward um, the food transition and healthier and more sustainable diets. So um, if you look at this uh, report, um, we can um, find classical uh, principles like we have to eat more uh, vegetable foods uh, together with moderate amounts of animal products to ensure reaching nutritional needs. And um, we can also um, go for law processed foods, for example. And uh, we, what is interesting in this report is that we can also um, find a very interesting principles like uh, the, the necessity for sustainable diet to be desirable. Uh, to be acceptable by populations and uh, also to um, respect local culture and culinary practices and uh, knowledge and consumption patterns at local levels. So that's, uh, we are um, proposing with our approach, hashtag uh, positive food, uh, which is um, at Savencia, we defend a positive vision of health and healthy and sustainable diet, which uh, allows to uh, gather health and pleasure of eating. And uh, we have built the main axis of hashtag positive food on uh, the, these official uh, recommendations and orientations. And um, that's uh, what we um, have done in the frame of hashtag positive food with uh, our uh, nudge uh, vegan cheese, which uh, was uh, proposed in uh, nudging for good campaign in 2019. And um, we we're finalists for, for this campaign and uh, it con um, consisted on uh, providing uh, within a smartphone uh, application uh, recipes that gather uh, around our brands and that gather uh, also these several, uh, these official uh, guidelines and um, recommendations of FAO and uh, WHO uh, to facilitate the consumer to integrate these recommendations because uh, it's the, the theoric uh, aspects of recommendations is clear are clear and you have a lot of reports uh, national plans and so on but how the consumer um, implements them how to the consumer adopts them is not uh, very easy so we oriented uh, our uh, nudge vegan cheese uh, to help the consumer to uh, integrate in everyday eating behavior uh, these recipes that gather several um, uh, recommendations. So um, that's why we align always uh, our um, targeted behaviors to official uh, recommendations. Thank you very much for this sharing, Neta. I think that we do have the video right now that we can share about Gabo projects.
Ez az ilyen túlzás. Nem marulok neki, hogy neki nyilhászám. Ha a fiúknak is ugyanannyi dolgot kéne csinálniuk, mint a lányoknak, akkor a lányoknak is jut arra időjük, amit, amit szeretnének csinálni. Thank you for the video. I think that uh, this initiative was the, the Could Cur Award as far as I remember and definitely that, that, that was fine because that's not exactly where we may have expected that brand but that's very great that this brand can do that, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, I will switch Gabor and come back uh, on you. Please, can you share some recommendation or some tip for those who are listen, listening to us right now and would like to start a, a nudging for good initiative? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm very happy to do that. Um, one one framework that I find extremely helpful, um, and it's also from uh, from the nudging organization, is the ICTA framework, uh, which stands for identify, create, test, and adapt. And in the first step, when it comes to identification, it's super important to well define the problem that you want to address. So it needs to be a problem that matters to people, one that you can represent credibly as a brand or organization, uh, one that you can also make an impact on, that you can really turn it around, you can contribute to it. Um, and uh, last but not least, also that it's linked to a business opportunity, because at the end of the day, we also need to make it work. And as you identify this problem, it's also important to see what are the key barriers to tackle, what are the cognitive biases, what are the, what are the barriers standing in the way of coming to this ideal world, ideal state. In the create phase, what I found to be really critical is that we are leveraging the drivers of influence, identifying which are the right ones that are going to adjust those barriers, and also try not to try not to create your response in a silo. Rather, co-create it, involve your colleagues, involve different departments, involve consumers, involve potential allies, uh, behavioral scientists, lecturers. Um, any kind of organization that is believing in the same cause and willing to contribute because together you will have an even bigger impact. And um, the last item on the create bit is also leverage both rational as well as emotional arguments. I often say that these drivers of influence, they are not only brilliant for the external audience, but also to leverage those tools internally to convince your stakeholders. Leveraging things like reward, to showing what's in it, um, leveraging loss aversion to showing what is the risk we are facing if we're not acting on a certain topic, leveraging one step at a time, rather than showing it like this is a huge effort, rather show how you can build it up over time. And then when it comes to the test and the depth phase, um, it's really about implementing, tracking, uh, gathering all the learnings, and then adapting the approach and optimizing it so that um, you can drive effectiveness uh, and impact, but also considering the cost side, so you can drive efficiencies. So that's 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 kind of the framework we have been using. Thank you for that, Gabor. And Jackie, since you represent several brands in March Incorporated, do, do, do you have also some recommendation for all these brands and in order to uh, embed all of them uh, and uh, recommendation and tips for uh, nudging for good initiatives? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we um, are the, the overarching initiative that we have internally that supports all of our brands at driving uh, purpose and behavior change is called Make a Difference Marketing. So we want to make sure that all our brands have, make a meaningful and measurable difference uh, to consumers. And, and, and so within that framework, um, we very clearly mapped our, our, per, our company purpose, and the three critical purpose destinations that we've, def that we've defined that will drive a difference that will ultimately 
um, make a difference uh, moving forward. So they are a world where the planet is healthy, a world where everyone, people and pets is thriving and a world where society is, in, is inclusive. And so we use that overarching framework for make a difference marketing. And then we look at the brand roles uh, within that framework. So what brands, um, uh, what issues, sorry, can brands tackle to ultimately solve some of those um, issues in society and drive a meaningful and measurable difference. And so we look at each individual brand role, we carve out the space that we feel it has legitimacy to work within to support those ambitions. And then we see what nudges we can use to support um, the behaviour change. Um, I think it's really important to work with experts on the issues. Um, you can't solve these on your own. Um, the experts on the issues have identified that you want that brand to champion as well as the behavioural scientists to crystallise and identify the drivers of influence that can really tackle that issue. And for me, it's about keeping it simple and make it easy for consumers to understand. So really trying to be clear with consumers what you're asking them um, um, and incentivizing them um, to do with, with, the, with the actions that you're taking. I think it's so critical, and we've talked a lot about this today around testing and learning. That's the only way really you, be, you get better and you, you, your knowledge grows. And really, you know, share successes internally, create those small successes to create bigger successes um, through showcasing that with with other marketeers um, so that you can inspire them. But I think the most, most important thing um, is that you need to create a win win. So it needs to win uh, for the business. It needs to deliver quality growth. Uh, whilst doing what is right for society. And I think that's why it's so critical that you deliver that win-win to, to ensure a sustained performance and ultimately get the support you need internally to put the money behind the initiative and, and, and drive that. So I think that 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 win-win mentality is so across all stakeholders is so, is so important. Thank you very much, Jackie. Maybe we can have just one word of uh, of conclusion about what is the future of the nudging for good and the nudging for good award f from the the AIM brand uh, point of view. Sure. So, um, unfortunately, the scheduled nudging for good awards in 2021 didn't happen because of COVID, <laughs> naturally. Uh, um, so we we are now back to, you know, planning in terms of what could we uh, can do going forward. Um, see what learnings there are as well in terms, I mean, the record case is a fabulous uh, uh, example of what happened during that time that needed to be done quickly. Um, calling upon all different kinds of resources, um, but also to address issues that um, we've had conversations as well within the membership um, about some of the learnings that came out of the uh, last cases, um, into the, in the last awards, you know, and John List talked about it earlier in terms of scalability, you know, how do you scale these um, uh, kinds of initiatives? I mean, Jackie w just outlined very well that this is integrated in their business. Um, and uh, as Nikita said as well, in terms of looking at what guidelines from the FAO that, that that's the inspiration they start from there so to the question that was asked earlier about you know the the add-on at the end that that's not the way it's happening or the way it should happen and um, these are the examples of how it is happening but this takes time as well to integrate into the business we have to actually appreciate that as well yeah I think that we can switch with the question from the audience uh, uh, and we have a first one I don't know who wants to answer to this one but why is the nudge approach particularly useful in the FMCG sector? Who wants to answer? Well, I can start. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the, you know, within the FMCG sector, I think it's been, you know, it's been mentioned throughout the day as well. I mean, it's... Um, the consumer, uh, the repetitive experience as such of uh, consumers, how we can, what we're looking to do here with Nudging for Good is really to how, how do we how can we pivot or influence that uh, behavior in order to nudge it influence that towards a more sustainable or health or healthier behavior so given the fmcg sector i mean throughout our membership 
we're pretty much in every single household in Europe, globally. In Europe, I'm only Europe, so um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a responsibility that we can take, that we do take, and and that I think is why it is particularly interesting for the FMCG sector. Okay, do do you, Gabor, you 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 not only <laughs> say you want to add something? I raise my virtual hand, so um, I fully agree what Michelle said, and maybe just to build on top. A way to look at it is marketing is also all about changing behavior. And that's what that's what Nudging for Good does. It, it offers a really wide toolkit um, that is often, I think, not, not considered in its full extent that marketers can, uh, can leverage and actually drive this behavior change. And the second thought um, to build on top of that is, is also growing pressure on brands to make sure that they, they do more than create profit and, and produce products, but they are also getting scrutinized and they are getting invited to do more, to contribute more. And I think that's what that's what uh, behavior science and that's what nudging for good can do. Yeah, thank you for that compliment. We have a question for Nikta, uh, and then maybe after we can switch with the audience. Nikta, if you can give a, a quick answer of, as a nutrition specialist, on which subject does the nudge approach seems to you the most appropriate? The sound problem. Can you repeat the, the question? Yeah. Sorry. As a nutrition specialist, on which subject does the nudge approach seems to you the most appropriate? We have to uh, keep a, um, a holistic vision on. on um, Diet and um, I don't know if we can really uh, uh, say that this uh, item and topic is more important than uh, another. Um, for nutrition aspects, we have, as I told you, at Salencia, uh, we consider that um, the pleasure of eating and the um, social and uh, psychoaffective um, dimension of eating is very important to be integrated to uh, solutions for behavior uh, changes. Uh, we cannot just uh, say we have to change like this uh, without considering um, the impact on cultures and consumer perceptions and so on. So uh, if uh, I, th I think we have to uh, keep a holistic vision and uh, to uh, consider uh, the pleasure of eating and uh, um, nutrition uh, needs to be to have um, health. Uh, uh, for all type of populations. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to uh, put the accent on one item when we're talking about uh, uh, diet and uh, food. Yeah, that, that's a nice answer. And I think that's not only for diet, but for a lot of topic on nudge because of spillover effect and some effect that could be not expected on one aspect of the behavior because we try to tackle one other aspect of the behavior. So thank you for that. And so we have one question here. Yes, please. So um, I hope it's not going too controversial. I've got, you know, I'm a true, I'm a true believer of uh, ma making sustainability always desirable. Um, but very often I'm being said, well, yeah, but I'm not really believing in that. It's because of greenwashing or social washing. So maybe to all the brands, new Michelle, just because you've got all of this breadth of experience, is it a topic that's top of mind? And if so, how is it tackled and so that nudge are not seeing as sludge? Yeah, it's nudge, not sludge. Yeah, so there's there's two aspects to this. So the, first of all, there's um, the whole approach is um, the drivers of influence. I think Gabor mentioned it and um, that was mentioned earlier as well. There is a whole methodology behind this. Um, we've been very briefed um, this afternoon, but there is a whole methodology and thinking in terms of what you should apply and how you should apply it within the business. Um, and Jackie alluded to that earlier as well, you know, the in integration, you know, for the brands and what they take on. So that's de that has to come with this. And when you are judged, if you know, in the awards, for example, the jury go have a have a whole methodology behind how they assess the cases. 
which is based on that. Um, and the jury consists of, just to be clear, the jury consists, as, as we said earlier, Cass uh, was the chair in 2019 with Eric, but then it was the WWF, the World Economic Forum, BEC, the European Consumer Organization. So it's not the industry actually that's it's the uh, specialists from the academic side and also those who represent consumers but also who represent other um uh, spheres uh, on the sustainability side. So that jury, they have a process that they follow. Um, and you have to, I mean, there's only a few people that win. <laughs> you know, So th there is actually quite a strict adherence to that. It's a really important issue for the industry. Um, and that is something that we, uh, and we're addressing as well at a legislative level, at a, on, on a policy level, where we want uh, to ensure that that is not allowed, that you our position as AIM is no data, no claim. You can't make a claim without data. Jackie, you were mentioned in, uh, in the answer from Michelle. Do you want to add something or do you fully agree, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I fully agree with what Michelle has said. And it's really important that, you know, it's already been talked about today, but the importance of trust, you know, so brands have a very powerful role, but that role needs to be grounded in truth and facts and data. And so in order to create trusted campaigns um, that, that, that actually make a difference. So that's why we have in all of the work we do, is it making a meaningful difference and is it a measurable difference? And that is important that we look at that. And I think I've already mentioned this, but the importance of bringing in experts, independent experts, and Pierre mentioned it as well. Uh, when he spoke earlier about the importance of bringing incredible experts to help you with the research um, to ensure you're asking yourself those critical questions. Um, and so I think that's that's very important too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we have no more time for any question. I, I would just like to conclude in regarding that question and all this Nudging for Good initiative. I remember that when we presented the Nudging for Good Award and the Nudging for Good initiative to Kassenstein, he said that he was quite amazed because for him, Nudge was mainly used in public policy and he find the idea of having uh, uh, synergies between brands and public policy, policy uh, very, uh, a, a very good, to be a very good idea. So I think it could close quite uh, uh, happily this uh, session on nudging forward. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for the audience to be there and uh, see you soon. So I believe we still have Pierre on the line. Just to do a bit of a wrap up of our session here on fast moving consumer goods. Pierre, I know you know many of the people that we've just been speaking to and now you've heard some of these case studies again and some of them for the first time. Any, any impressions, any, any thoughts on how different brands are, or organizations are applying behavioral science for consumers? Hi, it was uh, great to hear uh, these uh, great speakers again. And uh, there are many things that uh, I think we can uh, summarize from what we've heard. Um, I mean, first of all, the importance, uh, obviously, of uh, looking at uh, the theory in, in a particular context and uh, nothing really can uh, allow us to avoid uh, this um, this step uh, we heard it you know in Italy we saw it in, in the other cases and then uh, I think it's also very important that uh, we remember uh, the uh, critical aspect which is you know we have to engage with the the, the people the customers the parents the, the children uh, we cannot just assume because it's good that uh, they will necessarily follow. Um, it has to be acceptable. It has to be acceptable by the uh, end consumers, and but also everybody else involved. I mean, I've been fortunate to be uh, working on, uh, on many projects, some with Aventia, Nikita, and, and Mars, uh, with Jackie. And you know, clearly, you want the trade to be also involved. And uh, there was a recent initiative uh, by the Consumer Goods Forum where we tried to have around the table retailers uh, the, uh, and, and manufacturers to work together because uh, everyone has to be involved and everyone has to uh, understand the, the value for anything uh, sustainable to work. Because remember in FMCG and in many other cases, in fact, for most chronic diseases, it's repetition is the key. It's not getting someone to do the right thing once, it's to do it repeatedly. And that's where it's so hard. I think you bring up a good point that there, you know, in our panel of, of speakers today, we've talked mostly to manufacturers and kind of brand owners, but there is that critical um, role of, of the retailer. Do you have any thoughts, uh, Pierre, in terms of engaging retailers or the right kind of challenges 
to bring to retailers where they can have an impact on positive behaviors for for shoppers because you know we know a lot a lot happens either in brick and mortar retail or, or online any thoughts there now clearly uh, retail is key uh, this is uh, first of all where we get the data we heard from john that you know data has to be in our dna uh, retailers also uh, can have more degrees of freedom because uh, whether you are uh, a food service company let's take the example i know best uh, Compass, Sodexo, etc. Uh, you don't care so much if you, if you sell uh, one food versus the other, uh, but you care about, uh, of course, your customers, the, the eaters being happy, but you also care about the other customers, the company being happy with, with this. And I was just with Google in New York City and looking at the fantastic uh, number of different cafeterias and bars, etc., and how they've actually made it into an, a science, testing many of the ideas and advancing the ideas that we in research have looked at. For example, the uh, description, describing uh, healthy food based on, 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 on sensory elements. Uh, it's my grandmother's food. It comes from this part of China and not the other parts. Uh, the distance, the physical distance, making sure you don't grab um, uh, a snack just when you wanted to have something to drink just because it's there. I mean, all of this, uh, I think smart companies like Google understand that uh, it is there's the short term aspect of cost and satisfaction, but there's also the long term, and you need everyone to uh, be on, on board. So I think uh, clearly retailers should be part of the loop, um, both online and offline. And often they will be the ones who will implement uh, the the solutions. Now remember that almost seventy five to eighty percent of all the Nutri score, just to give another example that we see uh, is uh, because the private labels, the store brands of retailers have decided to put it. They are really at the forefront of all of this nudging for good uh, in, at many levels. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, Pierre, I have two questions for you. Uh, first one is um, for you, what is your perspective for the behavioral science to help more and what do we need to improve to better help consumer in this area of consumer goods? So I think the perspective is good, first of all. You know, we heard from many people from different levels uh, being interested in, in, in behavioral science, which is a term I prefer to nudges. I think we need to be a bit careful um, not to call everything and anything a nudge. Uh, people say, oh, it's a price reduction, it's a nudge. No, the price reduction, it influences economic uh, equation, it's not a nudge, okay? Uh, we remove a product, uh, we change your assortment, it's a nudge, no. So I, I think to me, the danger here a little bit is uh, that we overpromise and there's a hype. Everybody thinks, oh, okay, I know what to do, uh, default and social proof and that, there you go. And it's not that simple. The, um, the goal, again and again and again, I mean, this is me, the researcher, the nerd saying, is uh, to um, not think it's easy and test and, uh, and try and, um, and then publish the results so we can learn. Um, there was a recent great paper by the Behavioral Insights team where they actually shared all the results. So no uh, problem of publication bias. We call it the file drawer problem that the, we only publish the studies that work. And, uh, and, and this way we can collectively uh, work together. But I think what BVA is doing, uh, we organizing these conferences where we share or we learn from, from one another, we build um, this foundation for uh, knowledge where uh, that's really, really important. And we go one step at a time. We don't uh, feel that uh, we're gonna solve everything at once. We remember that nudges is just one tool among many uh, that will help us uh, uh, achieve our goals. And, uh, and if we do it uh, systematically, we take our time, I think um, we're in good shape. Great, and a more personal question uh, now, Pierre. What uh, are the main areas of interest for you? Where are you investing your time? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I should also share a personal anecdote. I think we uh, we went a bit fast uh, before, but um, I mean, I, I, I'm i really delighted to be here because I was in touch with both uh, BVA and, and PRS, you know, before you guys were together. And uh, I'm very, I've been seeing the evolution of the, of what the work you've done. And uh, I think um, 
uh, I will actually answer my, my answer is, you know, um, to be closer to the field. I think um, this is really the key. So in the topic that I, that I know a little bit about, which is a healthy food choices, uh, we've done and I've done and I will always do studies where we are putting people in the lab or we ask them questions online. But um, I really noticed, and we knew it before, but just really showing the huge difference there is between what people say they do when no one is watching and, and what they actually do when no one is watching. So for example, when we tested in uh, 60 supermarkets, uh, four front of package nutritional labels, uh, it was a 2 million euro study funded by companies and, and the French social security, uh, it's a lot of effort. And in the end, what well, we found things that we were kind of expecting, like you know, um, the summary scores, those that help you put one label, one grade, uh, are easier for people to follow, so they tend to have a bigger effect, fine. But the thing that I got really a shock thing for me was to find that in parallel, there was another study that looked at exactly the same labels using the same methodology. And it was a really good study, uh, but where people, were asked, what would you buy? And they did one uh, purchase and then another one with the labels. Well, we find the same ordering of the labels. Nutri-Score was still the most effective. However, the size of the effect, it was 17 times smaller in the field than in the lab study, 17. For some labels, it was like, it was like 44 times smaller. So uh, if we want something to work, we need to uh, collaborate uh, with companies, with, uh, and you know, you know this in vivo, you know, it was from the start predicated on this idea that we need to put people in real life, um, in free living conditions. I think this is going to be, uh, to me, the, what I find most exciting. Uh, testing uh, what's going on in, uh, outside the supermarket in fast food restaurants, that's what I'm testing now testing uh, what's happening in terms of food waste in cafeterias, that's what I'm testing now, uh, looking at what can we do to achieve this uh, triple win. It's a win for uh, health, it's a win for business, and it's also a win for consumers. It's a win, consumers have to see a win here, otherwise, and consumers at large, the end consumers and, and the trade, the direct customers, otherwise nothing will happen. So this is uh, what I'm, uh, I'm a bit working on right now. I, I'll, I have, I'm happy to talk about it for six hours, but I know it's the end of the, the <laughs> day. six and I hours. Want to be very, very short here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Pierre. We really appreciate it.